world today. Um, let's see. Last time we were able to look at a variety of sphinx moths. I came to the table thinking that maybe we would draw a sylphid um, or a carrion beetle, but then I got outvoted by you ladies and gentlemen, so we decided to look at silk moths, a variety of different species that I have, and we ended up sketching the white-lined sphinx moth. Um, today, <coughs> today I was thinking about sketching this carrion beetle with you. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't gotten any responses in my, um, I haven't gotten any responses in the chat, so I think that that's the beetle that I'm gonna go ahead and sketch. Um, some of you may know, because I mentioned it last time, but carrion beetles are, well, they used to be in the family, they used to be in the family Sylphidae, and recently, after more genetic, um, after genetic studies came out in March of this year, Sylphids lost their family. They are no longer their own family. Carrion and burying beetles have been kind of smushed into uh, all of the rove beetles. So rove beetles, right. <coughs> rose beetles are in the family Staphylinidae, and so now all rove beetles, carrion beetles, and burying beetles are all in this one family. Um, it kind of messes with keys now because the keys a lot of times say that a staphylinid or a rove beetle has half length elytra, um, whereas both car well as uh, carrion beetles have full um, length elytra and burying beetles will sometimes have shorter but definitely not as short as rove beetles. So their elytra are very, very different, but um, genetically they're similar enough and and they're kind of intermixed within each other, so we know that they are all in the same family. So instead of being called sylphids, they are now called sylphines, sylphony. And so they've become a sub a subfamily inside of that family. So that's what we're going to be calling them. Now today we are looking at the American carrion beetle. And that is going to be too large to fit in my screen, so I'm going to have to shrink it down a little bit. All right, so we're talking about the American carrion beetle today. Um, I actually, what spurred this is I recently saw a huge pile of carrion beetles at a local nature park. Check this out. So um, here I have, there's a pair of mating carrion beetles here, a pair of them mating here, another male right here that was trying to get on top of one of these two piles. He was failing pretty hard. And then flies pretty much everywhere. So what I'm seeing by that is underneath, be underneath all of those um, insects was likely organs of some type of animal. There was a dead animal there. And they were all feeding and having a good smorgasbord of a time. But because I saw so many of them, I thought, wow, isn't that a great time to come online and talk about them and the fact that they are actually rove beetles now. Um, so I'm going to be writing a, a short blog about those too because the paper that came out was really interesting. I've read it through another time now. And they talk about the evolution of beetles and how long ago, like in the millions of years ago time frames, how long ago these beetles were emerging and um, in like the different eras and how they were interacting with the plant life of that time and how we think these beetles um, became so diverse, right? Because beetles are the most diverse order of insects on the planet, and insects are the most diverse animal on the planet, right? So the beetles are pretty, pretty impressive. Um, awesome. So I figured I would show you that picture that I shared. And so this is an American carrion beetle. Uh, my American carrion beetle does not fit underneath the microscope fully, I don't think. Let me go check that. 
I don't think I checked. Yeah. No, he's not going to be able to fit all the way underneath my microscope, so I'm going to go ahead and get us a focused image here, and then I'm going to pull him over to my desktop camera so that we can um, measure him with a, uh, we can measure him with a ruler. Alrighty, so if I'm looking at the length of my, if I'm looking at the length of my American carrion beetle, and I am comparing, and I'm looking at from the very front of the head all the way to the back, all the way to the back of the elytra, we're looking at about two centimeters. So my beetle here is about two centimeters long. <clears throat> And I actually do have the species name for this. We call this species Necrophila americana, or the American carrion beetle. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get this, um, get this started. Necrophila americana, the American carrion beetle. So this beetle does um, does like to eat all things fleshy, right? Is um, generally one of the um, not one of the absolute first to come to something rotting and breaking down, but definitely in the kind of the first wave where it likes to it it likes um yeah it likes kind of the the soft gooey meat meaty parts right kind of the dead gushy stuff rather than it getting hard like a like a dermestid or a skin beetle a lot of times wait till the very very end and they're going to be feeding on things like bones and muscle tissue that's left over but the American carrion beetles really like to find fresh, um, fresh dead animals. And so they'll, their babies both feed on rotting flesh and other insects that are coming like, um, like maggots and things like that. And the adult beetle feeds on the same things that the immatures do, that the grubs do. So there is a little bit of competition between the adult beetles and their young, which is unique because a lot of times the adult and the grubs of even the same species are going to be feeding on either a different plant or a different part of the plant so that they're not competing against each other. Alright, so what I want to do is I want to kind of get as zoomed out as I can so that um, we are looking at more of a full body view of our specimen here. And I'm going to pull it on over so that we can kind of see it in the top corner as we are moving through our beetle. So I have a head here. The head is oblong, but you can see that it has this type of Y shape with the eyes on the end. Um, you know that I like to go ahead and sketch a very light outline as I start, and then I'll go back through and solidify some of those lines as I'm talking about their body parts. Very good. So, I'm going to go ahead and get our head started. So we've got this area that's kind of wide for the eyes, and then it's going to come up. We've got this basic head shape. I might have to modify that as I am. I may have to modify that when I come back, but I'm trying to give myself just a basic 
size and shape reference. So I've got my head taken care of, and I want... Ooh, the head's too big. And that's why we do this. Don't mind me trying to get this right. I hope that you ladies and gentlemen out there are also trying to get your first sketch, your kind of your outline sketch. So I've got something along the lines for my head here. I'm definitely going to have to work this out when we zoom it in. And then we've got this kind of nice wide pronotum. I make sure that it stays kind of round and it does come up and circle a little bit of those eyes. So I'm going to come up just a little bit. And then we have the elytra, so this first pair of wings down here. And those are going to be left and right sided. There is some separation between the elytra and the pronotum, so making sure we've got that separation on either side. All right, and then as I'm moving down, I wanted to go ahead and I'll move the specimen down on the microscope so that we can kind of see the back of it. So you can see this specimen has, um, has its elytra separated just a little bit, and that that can be natural, all right? So sometimes they will kind of walk around with their elytra opened just a little bit like that. A lot of times they, um, a lot of times they're all the way closed. Um, but if you would like to sketch it just the way that you see it, then that would be correct for a live specimen too. Um, I want to make sure that we do have this triangle up here. This is our scutellum. That's going to be this segment here in between the two elytra, right? Our elytra do, our, our, our overall insect is actually pretty wide. He's pretty, pretty, pretty wide, pretty hefty. But then you can see, um, he gets kind of narrower, his wingtips, um, his wingtips from his elytra kind of narrow down into these points. So I'm going to go ahead and, and leave mine just a little bit open like he did. So we've got this rounded kind of tip at the end. And so it gets narrow and comes back out and gets nice and wide. And you can go ahead and do that on both sides. Now, most of the time, uh, the elytra on uh, the American burying beetles are, um, are dark all the way down. They're kind of black all the way down to the wingtips, but, um, there's a small group of them, and they are still the same species, um, but I believe they live mostly in the Midwestern region, and they will have these yellow tips on the ends of their elytra. So if you look right about here, you can see that there are yellow tips on the top of this elytra, and that is a recognition that this specimen was collected in the Midwest. Um, this specimen was actually collected in Michigan in Jackson County. Yep, yep, yep. All right, so I'm, I think I like, it's funny, if you look at this beetle, the, um, the left-hand side on the specimen is more angular, probably just because of the angle that we're looking at it on our screen, but I drew it exactly how we see it, and I want both sides to be more like the right side. So I'm going to come out and make this just a little bit more bulbous so that we don't have as strong of an angle there. That's better. I like that a lot better. 
All right. And then the end of our abdomen is actually going to be up here. So you can see where there's that dark area. All righty. Let's go ahead and zoom in on the head and see what it looks like. We will zoom out and check out the antenna too. When I put the specimen under the microscope, I try to make sure that all the characters that we're seeing are going to be on the same plane, so they're even with the microscope. Sometimes that means putting the pin on a little bit of an angle. There we go. All right, something that I find uh, find interesting um, are these long hairs behind their eyes. I'm curious about the function of those. Um, it does have our two large compound eyes here. There are no simple eyes or ocelli to speak of. Um, I would say that this right here is the labrum or the upper lip, you can see that there's this, um, you can see that there's like a, we call we would call it a suture or a, a line in the exoskeleton from here to about here across the length of the head and that separates our labrum. Now up here we have a variety of different mouth parts kind of sticking up. Our American carrion beetle has chewing mouth parts so they're going to have labial and maxillary palps. Um, they're going to have mandibles, an upper and a bottom lip. So what we're seeing there, this little segmented piece that looks like it's coming out and going back in, that's one of the labial palps. We like to call them mouth fingers. <laughs> um, and then there is a little sharp point right here on the left that you can see, and that's the tip of one of the mandibles. All right, so I'm going to go ahead up here into my into my head region and I'm just going to erase what I sketched because I know that I can do better. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to start with my head central and I've recently when working with students and stuff have been using a a ruler for my center line. It's been helping a little bit. Look at that. I'm going to have to center the pronotum a little. Okay, so I have this little bit of a center line going. Sorry guys, I'll have to take that call later. Alright, so I've got the back side of the head and then I'm going to go ahead and give make it nice and wide and come up. And this angle that's coming up, that's where our eyes are going to be. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself these nice large compound eyes here and here on both sides of the head. And the edge of those compound eyes kind of goes ahead and expands a little bit past where that angle was leading. Looks like I want to make sure I stay centered. There we go. All right, so I've got this head shape all, all getting started. And then I want to make sure that my head protrudes forward like this. Oh no. I think my camera, I think my phone froze my camera. Give me a moment. So I promise I'm still here, and um, when my other camera starts back up again, I will let you know. All right. So I have my compound eyes here, and I'm going to be making this head kind of protrude forward a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and give it 
It almost kind of looks like a snout, but it's not a snout. It's just a lengthened head. Maybe not that lengthened. We're going to split that one in half. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is actually just give my head that flat end. So I'm going to do it kind of before that, um, before that labrum or that upper lip. And then up here, I'm going to go ahead and give it this M shape. That's your upper lip. And on the left side, we see that little labial pulp, and I'm just going to go ahead and give a pulp on each side because I know that when they're alive, they're kind of sticking out and waving around a little bit. Oh, no. As it turns out, look at me. My camera accidentally ran out of batteries because it wasn't plugged in. So it might take a minute for that other camera to um, come back to us. But that's all right. We're going well here today. All right. So I have the basic head shape. I'm going to go back in and, oops, and add some of these longer hairs that we can see kind of on the back of the eye and over the head. I think that those hairs are kind of cool. And so I wanted to make sure that I I included them in my sketch and then let's see now all we have to do is add these come um, is add these antenna right here um, like you, you know we have a scape a pedestal and then the flagellum those are gonna be the parts of my antenna so this first segment right here that's kind of longer this is the first segment of the antenna that we like to call the scape spelled S-C-A-P-E. All right, so I've got my antennal socket right here, kind of at the base of the eyes. And then I'm expanding this upward here and here, and I've got those long segments. And I'll go back in and erase those cross lines. Um, and I want to, because we're looking at our antenna, I want to go ahead and change the focus on my microscope so that we can see one full antenna and we can get a good look at it while we're sketching. There we go. All right, so that's that first segment that we just sketched and now we're going to complete our antenna. So we have another one, two, three, four segments before they start to become part of this club. So I'm going to go ahead and start sketching these in here. These are one, two, three, four, four, four little itty bitty segments. And then as they get to that very end, they're going to have, they're going to be getting longer and longer and wider. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I believe this sixth segment is actually two there at the very end. But one, two, three, four, five, six is what I'm going to be building. So those first three look very cup like. They look like they're little cups that kind of fit into each other, but then just keep expanding like this. And then the last three are kind of like inside of those cups. So they're a little bit more rounded. And then that last segment, I believe, is cut in half. So that's kind of what, what our, what our antenna is going to look like a little bit. And then I'm going to go ahead and sketch on the other side. So this is one, two, three, four with these cups. All right. Want to make sure that I've got these. Yeah, something like that. So you see that it gets, it's very narrow, and then you've got this club at the end. And the club is a variety of different segments. 
All right, so I'm pretty happy with our head so far. We're going to be able to scoot over and look at our pronotum. Now, this is characteristic for carrion beetles in our area, or carrion beetles in the United States, really. This is Necrophila americana, so generally, they're going, this species has a large yellow uh, pronotum, and it's going to have a black, uh, black spot in the center of it. Now, this black centralized patch is going to be, um, can be, have a lot of different shapes. So it can be smaller, it can be larger, they can have like different patterns, but they're generally about the same size and they're black right there. So you've got this black central spot and a yellow pronotum. <clears throat> All right, so looking at my pronotum, I want to make sure that it's got some space behind the head. So this head's going to come down and angle down just a little bit, and then it's going to come back up and around. And you can see that I'm using these lines as kind of a guide, but they are not, they're, I'm not letting them limit me because I know that a lot of times, the first time I go through and I sketch something, a lot of those lines, they're probably going to be off by just a little bit. All right, so I want to make sure that my pronotum stays nice and wide and nice and rounded. And I, it looks like my pronotum is going to go just a little bit longer than expected. So I'm going to go ahead and erase some of these lines so that I have space to expand. All right, so I've got this. It's coming up nice, and then it rounds down and out, and then the edge of our pronotum is nice and rounded here. All right, and I'm going to try and mimic that on the other side. Okay. All right. So once we get to the edge of the pronotum, you can see that this bottom line is not just all the way straight across. It actually comes down just a little bit and then it comes back up. Let's see. Right about there. So that's going to be the shape of our pronotum. It's nice and rounded. I'm going to make sure that I erase some of these kind of overage lines from where I went just a little bit too far and solidify these lines just a little bit. Awesome. Now I do want to add my black spot or my coloration here in the center of the pronotum. I'm glad that, Jody, you're out and about playing in your garden. I hopefully you see this a little bit later. Shout out to Jody. Thank you for, for thank you for dropping by and commenting. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and add this um, this kind of coloration on the pronotum here, so it gets nice and wide. It almost to me looks like a like a vest of some type, maybe? Like the shape up here and the bottom almost looks like an open vest. I'm gonna go ahead and um, and give it a little bit of shading to make it dark here and I'm actually gonna smudge it out a little bit you can see that there is a darker um, area around it too kind of where let's see you've got this bright yellow all the way around the edges and then it's this this brown color before it gets black so if I go ahead and I kind of darken and shade in this dark spot and then fade that out just a little bit, it's going to give me that same kind of shading. 
And so I'm okay with that. All right. I don't have my yellow. That's all right. All right. Let's go ahead and scoop back. We've got the pronotum taken care of. I'm sad that my camera battery turned off. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I think that it's about to come back. Silly me forgot to plug it in. Alrighty, look at that skewtellum. So this is how we spell skewtellum. If you look, it's this triangular place right here behind. Um, it's this triangular plate right here behind the pronotum. So if you look right about here, there's this angle down and a triangle over. So that is going to be our skewtellum and is going to be where it's kind of like in between our wings here. So I want to make sure that we are staying true to that center line. And that's where the tip of the scutellum is going to go. So I'll just make sure that we're going this way. And then it comes up at an angle like this. And that is our scutellum. All right. I'm going to have to message that person back. They're blowing up my phone. I want to go ahead and zoom out as far as I can so that we can see the edges of the elytra so that we can go ahead and make sure that those are correct. And then we'll zoom in and look at the texturing on the elytra. Man, turn that down. They can get in contact with me in just a little bit after we get this fi finished up. All right, so I have my pronotum. I've got this scutellum. I'm going ahead and looking. Oh man, I didn't scoot it down enough. I need to see the humeral. The we call it the humeral angle. It's the shoulder angle. All right, so up here, you can see that these elytra don't match my pronotum exactly. So there's going to be just a little bit, there's just going to be a little bit of space here. So make sure you've got that taken care of. It's not going to come out all the way just like this. Now we've got, let's see. All right, so we've got that humeral angle taken care of, and I want to come down. All right, so that's going to be kind of our shape for the elytra. It gets kind of wide, and then it starts narrowing at the base to these points. And we're going to try again over here. Alrighty, so those are going to be our two angles. I see that I've got this stronger angle on the left side than the right side, and I want to make sure that they stay mostly even, so I take care of that. I'm going to go ahead and make this area very dark because our abdomen, we're not really going to be able to see from between the elytra, so I'm just going to make this kind of a very dark sliver. That gives us an idea of where the body is actually. That's fine. That's great. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and zoom in and check out some of the some of the texturing on the edges. Um, this looks very web-like to me. Ladies and gentlemen, guess what? I'm back! Yay! Also, 
Awesome. So my face is back. That's always good. Um, and we have this guy right here. Now, the overall impression that I get from the structuring and the elytra is that they it has these longer lateral veins. I don't know. I wouldn't call them veins. Maybe I'd call them ridges. Um, it has these longer kind of vertical ridges. And then in between the ridges, every now and again, you have a, a cross ridge that makes it kind of look spotty across the elytra. And so I'm just going to go ahead and give some of these kind of cross veins. And they're not straight. They're very much kind of wiggly, wavy. They look like... <laughs> they look like somebody took paint and blew bubbles into it and then left the ridges. That's how I've, I've always thought of them. Now, if I was going to go in and really do this detailed, I would actually end up doing lots of dots because the, the, the actual um, ridges, if we zoom in far enough, are actually individual spots, I think. So I would just go in, instead of doing some type of shading, I would go in and fill these in with dots. Um, let's see. I don't know. I think we're doing pretty good, ladies and gentlemen. And we don't have too many people on today, so I, will, I don't know if I'm going to be sticking around for too much longer. I like to talk to you, ladies and gentlemen. So if you run into this Sunday class and you think, man, I wish it was longer, invite some friends and hang out with me. I'm pretty happy with this. I think that my antenna could have been just a little bit longer. I could have extended those just a little bit. It looks like um, in the in the size of my beetle, I probably could have been another centimeter on those antenna. Because if we look at the uh, length of my antenna on my specimen, they come, they round and they come back to about the middle of the pronotum. So that's about three centimeters. So I could have made those about a whole another centimeter longer. Um, that's something that I would probably fix in the future. But that is our beetle from the top. Um, there if you ever if you if you see this video and you would like me to flip over my American carrion beetle so that we can check out its legs and its bottom side go ahead and leave a comment um so letting me know and maybe in one of the future lessons I'll, I can go ahead and do that for us um but for now I do want to <clears throat> I do want to say Thank you for hanging out with me today. I know there aren't too many of us here today watching, but I hope that you'll be back in the future. You know, if you are seeing this in the future, go ahead and let me know um, if you've seen uh, one of these carrion beetles and where. Was it on a, um, was it on roadkill? Was it just hanging out in the woods? Where'd you see them? Uh, I do teach virtual classes on OutSchool to students under 18. I also do have the ability to teach um, adult or, or, or adult classes. If you'd like, you can just reach out to me on my website. Um, this is where you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I put out new videos all the time. I live stream twice a week, and I've been trying to whiteboard a little bit more. Um, I recently posted a video on the Joro spider, so you can go and check that out if you'd like. Um, and this is where you send me a tip if you would like, if you really enjoyed this class today, if you want to support me and to support um, my spreading of insect knowledge. This is what really, really helps me to keep doing what I'm doing and to be able to continue to teach you and, and um, to share my love of bugs, not only virtually, but in person and around the city of Philadelphia. So thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and stay buggy.